Welcome once again to our English class. Today, we want to look at um, an interesting topic. Yes, interesting um, topic at that. Why? Because um, it's um, one of the topics that are set in our paper one, and it's a compulsory one. It's not what you can run away from, and as such, it's important that we look at it closely and that is comprehension all right comprehension is from the word comprehend which means to understand which means to understand so we actually have to look at how we answer comprehension questions but before that we look at its definition the approach and finally failures um, that people encounter by virtue of their inability to approach comprehension questions appropriately. All right, I guess we are ready. Let's go. All right, definition of comprehension. Now, we say that comprehension is an act of understanding a given passage, an act of understanding a given passage. Now, your ability to read something and understand what that very article, that very passage, that very newspaper, it's all about is what comprehension is. Now, some comprehension passages can be dicey, while some can be straightforward. Now, where you have a straightforward comprehension passage, there will be much ease in answering questions on that. But where the comprehension passage is hidden, the, the idea behind the passage is hidden, that you have to undergo critical thinking. It will demand extra reading and assimilation before you can attempt questions on it. And that is why we want to look at it and um, present to us the best way to go about reading the passage and understanding the passage before we are able to answer the questions. So comprehension is a process of reading, understanding, and explaining what is written in a passage. Your ability to read, to understand and explain what is written in the passage. You have read the passage holistically. You're able to understand the passage. You can explain the passage to someone, all right? That is what comprehension is. So for every comprehension exercise, there must be a passage to be read. You have your comprehension questions. There must be a passage. Without the passage, there are no questions. So you must go through the passage, understand the passage, the idea behind the passage, the subject matter, and all that um, are, are there to be understood before you can attempt the questions. So the purpose of a comprehension exercise is to test students' understanding of a given passage. That's the essence. In an exam condition, a comprehension passage is one of the uh, questions to be approached by students. It's for the examiner to test the student's ability in uh, understanding a given passage. So in comprehension, the thoughts of the writer are presented to students for reading, understanding, and explaining. I think I have said that in some way, that the thoughts of the writer, the, the, the writer has written expressed his thoughts or her thoughts. So it is now left for the students to read, understand, and explain. How do you explain that the questions that will be given? Your response to the questions would um, present your having read and your having understood the passage. All right, so having said that, let us look at other aspects. Now, this is a picture of comprehension, but there is no passage here a reading passage, but there is a pictorial. It's more we, what we call the picture comprehension. You, you, you look at the picture, you go through the questions, and you can answer the questions by virtue of the, question, the, the picture that you have. So the first question says, now we have looked at the, the picture. We could see some, some objects around. There is a house um, there in the picture. The house is painted. We'll have um, a rock right there. We'll have, um, I think that's the sun or the moon out. We have um, a chimney there that is up here is a chimney. You could see the windows. You have about four windows here. 
and you have your door. This is um, the, the, the entrance to the door. Then around the house, you have um, uh, a bare floor there where you could uh, walk through what we call a walkway to the house, while the other parts are grass, if I'm allowed to use that. All right, so how many windows do you see in the picture? This is a comprehension passage, but a pictorial one. So the question says, how many windows do you see in the picture? Now I want to answer five, four windows. There are four windows in the picture, or I can see four windows in the picture. What is the house door color? The house door color, it's brown. Is it night time in the picture? No, it is not night time. Yes, it is night time. The place is not dark, so I could actually say, but by virtue of this moon, if you're saying that the moon is out, then we could say it is night time. So there is a rock in the river. It's a question of true or false. True, that's a river, and this is a rock. Then the last question says, is there a chimney in the roof of the house? Yes, that's the chimney. Yes, there is a chimney in the roof of the house. So we've been able to answer the questions appropriately and we've scored, all right? So you've seen how I attempted the questions. Sometimes some examiners, um, like the Cambridge exam, they want you to give direct answers. Um, while in um, WIEC, all right, we are expected to ha use our preamble while answering. And that was why in each of the questions, I used my preamble number one. How many windows do you have? We have five windows. By that answer, the examiner knows I have been asked the number of windows that we have. What is the color, the house color door? The house color door is brown, all right? Or the house door is brown. So is it night time in the picture? Yes, it is night time in the picture, not yes. The examiner may not know. So we use preamble, but for Cambridge exams, they are not good with preambles. They go direct in answering their questions, but we introduce preamble as an, a leading or in an introduction to our answer. So let's look at the main thing. It says step-by-step -step approach to comprehension. What are the things I have to do while attempting my comprehension? It says comprehension demands a careful step-by-step -step approach. Majority of the students who fail this exercise do so because they are in a hurry to answer without taking time to understand the passage, and that is just the problem. So many of us, we become too much in a hurry. So many students, they just want to answer. They feel, oh, comprehension, there is nothing much there. There is a whole lot that you have to know. You have to understand. That was why we say comprehension has to do with understanding assimilation you read a passage understand the passage before you can explain your explanation is your ability to answer the questions appropriately so where you are answering the questions are when when you've not read you've not um, been able to understand the passage then what would you be answering or what would you be explaining apparently nothing so it is needful that as a student while attempting your comprehension questions you read the comprehension passage carefully, taking time to take note of key words, necessary words. Now, comprehension to a large extent is different from summary in the sense that there are certain words that are underlined. In summary, no words are underlined for you to identify anything. The only thing with summary is your ability to be concise in your writing. But for comprehension, there are a whole lot of questions to be posed. Unlike summary, you could just have one question for summary or two. But in comprehension, you could have well over seven to eight questions. And in these seven to eight questions are quite um, tactical questions way beyond the summary questions. All right, so you must read your comprehension passage carefully. And while reading your comprehension passage, take note of certain underlined words or phrases or sentences or clauses because definitely questions will be asked on those underlined words, phrases, and clauses. All right? So what do we do? These are the suggested steps. Read the passage very carefully and be sure the passage is fully comprehended. If you have not yet understood the passage, dearest student, go back to that passage, care less about people around you and how far they have gone. 
as long as you have your time, go back to the passage, do well to comprehend the idea behind the passage before you answer your questions. This should take more than one reading, depending on your skill and ability to read and understand the passage. I once said that when I took um, um, uh, the, the topic on summary, I did say it's that it is needful for students to read the passage more than once, depending on your skill. There are people who have um, innate being in reading and understanding easily. All right? There are people who have a knack for reading and understanding easily. That's the skill they have. You can't compare yourself with them. But where you don't have that skill in reading once and assimilating once, it's not out of place to read twice or even thrice. So you must do well to read more than once to keep yourself abreast with the subject matter or the theme of the passage. That's the first thing you have to have at the back of your mind. So you read the passage carefully to understand, to assimilate the passage. Understanding the passage demands you knowing what the passage is all about. So what's the point number two in putting down your answers? They need to, to be written in sentences, but make sure you give only one answer to a question. Your answers must be written in sentences and give only one answer to one question. Don't give more than one. If you're asked for an answer, give an answer. So put in putting down your answers, do them in sentences, except where the question need not be written in a sentence form, like in comprehension, where you have your underlined words. The underlined words will be demanded of you to give words or phrases. So in that case, they don't need sentences. But certain questions that need you to answer in sentences, do well to answer them in sentences using your preamble necessarily. Very important, right? So though you are free to use the words from the passage in your answers, you must be able to use your own words or expressions to show your understanding of the passage. Like I said earlier on, if in cases where the words used are not what you can easily change, it's not out of place, but make sure that where need be, use your own words as much as possible. That shows your understanding of the passage. Then where your answer should show comparison between two or more things mentioned in the passage, your answer must indicate or show the comparison. Oh, in what is the, 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 the similarity between the use of this and the use of that? The similarity between this, the use of a pen and the use of ink or whichever, you must compare them. Just like um, the summary question we took about robots, if we still remember, if you have gone through my teaching on summary, when we took the, the exercise, one of the exercises on sum in summary writing, it was about robots and human beings, how efficient robots are. And as much as robots are efficient and do not get tired, human beings are better off. So while responding to that question, it says in three sentences, why do admirers of robots see robots to be more useful than human beings? We were able to point out the usefulness of robots as against humans. There was an element of comparison. So where your question demands comparison, please do well to compare appropriately. Do not just give an answer without comparing that which uh, um, you're giving your answer to. All right, so that's that. Your answer must indicate or show the comparison. Number five says, where you are asked to substitute, it's very important, where you're asked to substitute a word or a phrase in place of some underlined words in the passage, the word must fit in perfectly in terms of what? Meaning and collocation. That's the right word. It has to fit in perfectly in terms of meaning, what the meaning of the word is. Is it still the same thing? The word you want to replace it with, does it have the same meaning? What right collocation? Is it in the same word class? Oh, it is a verb. Is it still a verb? All right. So you must use the right meaning and the right collocation. Point number six, when you are substituting a word or phrase with another word or phrase, if the word or phrase is an adjective or a noun, or in a particular thing, your answer should be in a similar form. 
All right, so that's it. Now, unlike the summary for the comprehension, I said it earlier, that there are certain words that are underlined. And because these words are underlined, it's um, a leeway for you to know that you will definitely be asked to answer questions on those underlined words or phrases. So for the underlined words, you have to acquaint yourself with the parts of speech that we have. When you're conversant with the parts of speech, obviously you will be able to know if the underlined word is an adjective, if it's an adverb, if it's a noun, if it's a verb. So if these underlined words have varying parts of speech or word class as it's implied, then you must change likewise. All right, so we will actually go through a particular comprehension passage to clear us on how to approach these very aspects in comprehension passage. All right, so finally, your answer, if taken as a whole, must make sense before any part of it is accepted as scoring. So your answer must be such that will make sense. If it doesn't make sense, it will not be regarded. If you are supposed to give an answer in a sentence form, then you have to give it in a sentence form. Else, it will not give you the required scoring. All right, number eight says, you must take pains to spell your words correctly. Very important. You must take pains to spell your words correctly. It shows your diligence. You have to spell your words when answering your questions. Spell your words correctly. When changing underlined words, <clears throat> you must as well spell the, un the, the new word that you have. The replacement for the underlined word, you have to spell it correctly because when not spelled correctly, that will result to deduction of marks. Then finally, your answers must be error-free grammatically too. Remember, the comprehension passage demands response. And in your response, they will be in sentence form. So do well to structure your sentences rightly. When you, you're writing your sentences, make use of your right concord. Your subject must agree with the verb. On no account should you use subject both in person or in number that does not agree with the verb. Remember, singular subject attracts singular verb, plural subject attracts plural verb except where the, the concord rule asks for something different. That will be on your part to dictate. All right, let's look at finally, on our outline, we have causes of failure in comprehension passage. Causes of failure, what are the reasons why people fail in comprehension? The reasons why people attempt comprehension passages yet they don't do well. Now one is that where a student gives two answers to a question and one of them is wrong. When a student gives two answers, you ask the question and you're to give an answer. You give two answers to a particular question and in your two answers, one of the two is wrong. That will attract no mark. So if you're giving your answer, be certain that your answers are right. If you're asked to give one answer to a question, please in-depthly read the passage and identify the right answer. Don't give two answers saying, if this is not it, then this is it. The examiner will not strike off the wrong one and mark the right one, no. Where you have given two answers and one is wrong, you have outrightly gotten a zero for that very answer. So you can only get full mark when two answers are correct. When the two answers are correct, that is where you will get a mark. But when the two answers, of the two answers rather, one is correct, one is wrong, it will be no mark for you. So where words and expressions are expected to be given to replace words or expression in the passage, the words or expression used as replacement must fit in perfectly in terms of meaning and collocation. So your words have to fit in appropriately. Now you have a sentence. That is why in changing these words in the comprehension passage, you don't change them. I tell my students, do not change the words or the replacement outside 
the passage. Change it in context because he has to agree. All right, the next one, deduction of a mark is the penalty for any grammatical and expression error. When your sentence is, is not grammatically right, then there will be deduction of marks. Then you will not score any mark for writing answers which are not contained in the facts or information provided. So your answers must be contained in the information provided. You are not allowed to bring in your own word. All right, so let us go to one of the questions. Let's attempt a passage and see how far we can go. All right, you are still taking 2015. All right. All right, so let's go through the passage. Let's go through the passage. It says, the mansion by the roadside in my village reminds me of a similar site in the state capital. Three decades ago, standing conspicuously by the highway in the heart of the city, the mansion posed a bold challenge to road users. It belonged to, a, to Chief Coco, who was regarded as untouchable in his community. Nobody dared step on his toes. Motorists had learned to steer clear of it. It was generally assumed, now you're looking at the underlying words, it was generally assumed that moving close to it would cost one one's life, all right? So they came, they came a governor who decided to widen all the major roads in the capital city. He stressed that this would involve demolition of buildings that fell within 20 meters of the road. However, although the governor also stressed that, com that compensations would be paid, Chief Koko was not impressed. He made it clear that nothing should tamper with his mansion, warning that whoso whoever defied him risked their consequences. All right. Now, not long after the governor's official proclamation, newspaper reporters had a, a few day speculating on the unprecedented confrontation with Chief. With time, news filtered out that he asserted that whoever dared him would certainly end up where others like them had gone. The message was clear. Defiance meant death. So reporters were pleading for a new route to circum circumvent the mansion. However, the governor made it clear that there would be no retreat. You see it? So you must have to change accordingly. Let's continue. Now, before long, work started on the project. One of the first casualties was a post office that was just some meters within the specified distance. It was cut into two. Soon, the frontage of a school nearby also followed. But it was assumed that things would be different with a mansion whose owner tolerated no effrontery. Day by day, the project moved closer to the mansion, with the heavy machine leveling one structure after another. Then, when it was clear that the mansion was next in line, the driver of the bulldozer requested to go on leave. Very funny. This got to the governor, who ordered the driver to first do his duty. He sent emissaries as envoys to the governor to spare his life since his children were still very young. That's an interesting passage. All right, let's continue. The following morning, people got a shocker. The governor had showed up at the site and asked for the key to the bulldozer, ready to assume the role of the driver, ready to assume the role of the driver. The driver, surveying the possible consequence tearfully climbed up and pleaded that the governor should please care for his children after his demise. The governor announced that if anything was to happen, he, not the driver, would be the target. Nice governor. So the driver got to the work, the driver got to work rather, and the mansion collapsed <clears throat> like a pack of card. Press photographers went to town with their cameras hoping to capture 
Chief Coco in action, hoping to capture Chief Coco in action. But nothing unusual happened, and soon the whole structure became a rubble. The aftermath, everybody thought either or both men would soon belong to the great beyond. But this much I know, that governor is still around, and so is the driver. Quite an interesting one. You can understand the subject matter centered on Chief Coco, his building, and the need for the governor to demolish buildings that are by the roadside. Um, what I would do is to answer, give the right word to the underlying words, all right? That's the aspect I want to really um, delve into, to give the right word to the underlined words, the right replacement, because the question will be of the underlined words, give another word that will fit into the sentence and still make the same sense. So that's what we are going to do. And remember at the point of teaching, I said it, that if the underlined word is in a verb form, the replacement has to be a verb. If it's adjective, it has to, the replacement has to be adjective. If it's a noun, it has to be a noun, vice versa. And if it is a verb, please, and the verb word is in a past form. Your replacement has to be in a past form, be it in a phrase word or just a word. It has to be in the past tense. If it's in the present, you keep it present. If it's continuous, it has to be continuous. All right, so the first one says, motorists had learned to steer clear of it. It was generally assumed. So. It was generally assumed, the word assumed, I can change it words with, it was generally believed that moving close to it would cost one's life. So you see that believed suits in appropriately. So it was generally assumed, that's what we believe in. Or it was generally thought that moving close to it, I can't say it was generally think. See, it doesn't, it doesn't even make sense. So it was generally assumed you have to go with believed, not believe. It was generally believed, not it was generally believe. If you write believe, you have failed it because the word first is in the past form. And secondly, it doesn't agree grammatically. It was generally believed that it doesn't. So we are changing assumed. You see that I changed it while reading. I didn't change it thinking that, oh, assumed. I have so many words as synonyms for assumed. So I can pick one of my choice. No, you can't pick any one of your choice. You can have as many words as possible for a particular word, but please change in context. That was exactly what I did. So let's look at another one. We have the next one is retreat. Obviously, this underlying part of the passage, not long after the governor will be is for grammatical name and structure. If it's not grammatical name and structure, then it will be figurative expression. But I'm certain it is grammatical name and structure. And obviously looking at it, I can tell you it's adverbial phrase modifying the verb had. But we are not looking at that. We are actually looking at the underlined words. That's the, those are the areas I want to touch. Now the next word is retreat. I'm not just going to give you the meaning of retreat or the word for re replacement for retreat. I will have to read the passage basically where the sentence that introduced the word and that is it here however the governor made it clear that there would be no retreat all right there will be no retreats now the retreat here is what no withdrawal there will be no withdrawal there will be no going back these are two words for it we have so many words for retreats all right, pulling out, but there will be no withdrawal. Nobody is going to withdraw from that which has been stated. No retreat, no surrender. All right, so we move to the next word. Where is the next word? Fine, this is it, the third paragraph. So it's, a, it's as if every paragraph will have something to work on. So the next paragraph we have specified. Now, where do I have the sentence? Apparently from the beginning. So it says, before long, work started on the project. One of the first casualties was a post office that was just some meters within the specified distance. 
within the specified distance. Which word can we use for specified? Within the stipulated, I think stipulated can go, within the a marked distance. All right? So I'm using basically specified. Remember, you're just giving one word. So once you have one word that suits, because the distance is specified, that means the exact distance. All right? So the specified is stipulated. Now we'll go to the next. This one is a phrasal verb showed up. Must I change with another phrasal verb? If you have another phrasal verb that is the same thing, synonymous with showed up, fine. But where you don't have a, another phrasal verb, you can use a word. That is why the question says, use a word or a phrase that means the same. So let's read. The following morning, people got a shocker. The governor himself showed up at the site. The governor himself showed up. Showed up could mean turned up. The showed up could mean came. Showed up could mean appeared. You see, showed up. I'm not saying the, the governor himself appeared at the, no. It's he showed up, so it has to be appeared. It has to be came, not come. It has to be turned up, not turn up. All right, so these are possible words that we can use. Apparently, if I'm in that condition of exam, I will obviously use appeared. The governor himself appeared, or the governor himself came at the site. All right, finally, we have collapsed. So he said, so the driver got to work and the mansion was collapsed, or rather the mansion collapsed. The mansion was pulled down. The mansion was pulled down like a pack of cards. Pulled down, brought down, demolished. All right? So that is it. Now we've been able to do justice to the underlying words. Now the onus is on you now to try. Go through a comprehension passage and see how you can change the underlying words and it will suit in the sentence. For the ones we've done, check your answers and see how far we have tried. All right, bye.